wanted to welcome everybody to Leap Link's uh, Women's History Month Fireside Chat. I'm your moderator today. I'm Rosie Maddio. Those who do not know me, I am founder and CEO of Maddio Communications. Um, we are the largest cannabis focused marketing firm in the space. Uh, we represent close to 70 cannabis companies, LeafLink being one of our clients and longtime partners. I feel very grateful to be here today um, with such a great team, uh, with the LeafLink team, and be able to introduce um, our panelists today. It's going to be a great discussion. And so without further ado, I'll actually let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, and I'm looking right at her, so I'll start with Nidhi. Thanks, Rosie. Uh, my name is Nidhi Lucky Honda. I'm the founder and CEO of Loon, which is a lifestyle brand centered around cannabis. We currently are in California and Arizona and uh, soon to be on the East Coast and uh, six additional markets. Uh, what brought me to weed is really consumer first. I, I was, I'm a total brand geek. I'm a consumer. I was super excited when cannabis went wreck in California and there were no brands that really spoke to me. And that was really, uh, seemed to be a common thread amongst my peers. And that was the catalyst. Uh, the madness that's kept me here is I think I'm a little bit of a glutton for punishment and love solving puzzles. And this is nothing if not, uh, Somebody who likes puzzles, uh, building anything in weed is just about that. So, uh, so yeah, that that's that's me. Yeah, and also, um, uh, would everybody introduce himself? And I forgot to mention this. What actually drew you to the cannabis industry, Nidhi? It, it was really, it, you know, honestly, Rosie, it was it was just that I was, you know, I was really, I think, intrigued by the fact that it's super complex and seemingly, you know, the myriad of things that we all know are true. The regulatory environment, state to state, is different. How do you create something that behaves like a brand inside an ecosystem that seems to be allergic to that? Uh, it was a challenge that I was up for. And I think the thing that, that propelled me into the space was that I like weed. I like consuming it. I wanted to Hell be yeah. part of that story. Like, what is it going to look like in the future when we start thinking about cannabis in the same way that we think about any other CPG, anything? So that's what brought me in. and and. Uh, like I said, stayed because there's something wrong up here, but <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think they say most entrepreneurs are a little bit of crazy in them. So I feel that. Uh, Whitney, do you want to go next? Why not? Um, hey, everyone. I'm Whitney Beatty. Um, I am a CEO of Apothecary Brands. We're sleek and sexy storage and humidity solution for cannabis connoisseurs. We make high-end humidors since 2016. Um, I am also CEO and the social equity applicant for Josephine and Billy's. We're the first dispensary in the country to focus on women of color, located on MLK in beautiful South Los Angeles. I'm also vice president of Supernova Woman. We're a 501c3 that seeks to encourage women of color to become stakeholders in the cannabis space. And we do that through education, advocacy, and networking. I'm also a vice president of SARA, which is the Cannabis Equity Retailers Association. We are a conglomeration of the 200 people who have been invoiced um, as social equity applicants in Los Angeles. And we come together for advocacy um, and group networking uh, within the space. Um, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> what was the other what question? Brought, what brought you here? God, um, it's actually really odd because I'm one of those people who, um, if you would have told me 15 years ago I'd be working in cannabis, I'd be like, you're out of your mind. Um, because I actually did not grow up using cannabis. I'm one of those odd people who Nancy Reagan told me not to do drugs and I kind of believed her. Um, I grew up in Detroit in the 80s. Um, in the midst of the war on drugs, I came to cannabis later in life because I had a situation while I was working in the entertainment industry where I was sitting at my desk and I thought I was dying. I thought, you know, I have heart palpitations, chest pains, um, radiating pain down my arm. I thought I was having a heart attack and I dro drove myself to the ER, uh, told them I was dying. And they said, lady, you know, you're not dying. You're having an anxiety attack. Um, and after trying to put me on lots of medications, my doctor said, have you tried cannabis? Um, and that small comment changed my life because it, um, you know, made me look into the plant and I was able to find something that worked for me. Um, but, you know, and even more importantly, maybe made me realize what I, um, uh, why I was kind of uh, nerve, what I was, I was nervous about. Um, and it made me learn about Harry Anslinger and the war on drugs and all those things. And it changed the game for me. 
Um, and so that kind of really drew, drew me into the space because if I felt that way, how many other people did? And if I had such a hard time learning that information, how many other people did? And what could I do to change that game? And that's kind of how we end up here at Josephine and Billy's, um, uh, you know, teaching other people and it's particularly women of color who are the most stressed cohort out there um, about terpenes, about cannabis, about CBD, and trying to get that information out to the community. I love it. And before we get to Abby, um, I'm seeing people are dropping um, comments in the chat. We're going to try to get to questions at the end, but if not, uh, just please leave your questions in the chat. We'll try to answer them maybe throughout the panel or afterwards, but please feel free to interact with the panelists. So without with that, Abby, introduce yourself. Thank you, thank you. Um, hello everyone, I am Abby Schnibby, co-founder and CEO of Plymouth Armor Group. We are New England's leading cannabis and cannabis cash transporter um, and supply chain logistics company. I am also founder and president of the Massachusetts Association of Cannabis Transporters, um, an association I started um, for third party transporters like myself to advocate and influence the <clears throat> regulatory environment as best we can since there's only so many of us and a lot of other uh, license types. Um, I'm also a board member of the Massachusetts Cannabis Company, which is a brand new soon to be vertically integrated cannabis company focusing specifically on female identifying um, leadership and cannabis leaders, um, as well as consumers. Um, what drew me to the cannabis industry? Um, I always make this cheesy tagline as well that I'm a glutton for punishment um, and always wanted to experience first the torture of startup life um, as well as, you know, I saw the challenge that was the cannabis industry and, and I love finding solutions to complex problems. Um, and, and also, um, I am a medical patient and been a consumer for, you know, quite some time. Um, so I wanted to be a part of this growing industry to ensure that like I am an active part of overturning the stigma around cannabis. Um, and also, you know, I want to be an active participate in overturning the negative impacts of the war on drugs because um, my background before cannabis was in social and racial equity. And so I figured this was a, another way to continue doing that work. That's awesome. And last but not least, um, Maggie Connor is actually one of the first other female entrepreneurs I met in the space, I think in 2015. So Maggie, introduce yourself. It's been great to watch your journey of a thousand years, I think. I know, but hang on. <laughs> um, so nice to be here and with these panelists. Thanks for having me. Um, I started a company, I came in 2015. I was on the investing side at first. I uh, started a company called Visito in 2017 that I ran here in California uh, until selling it last year and to Spark. And now I am working, thank you, for, um, for most recently Ascend Wellness Holding. So getting a very different point of view, working um, all in the Midwest and East Coast now. So a fun new challenge for me. What originally brought me to cannabis, one is a love for that plant, but growing up on the East Coast, it really took me moving to California in 2014 to even sort of register it as a career. Um, and so love of the plant, there's sort of a functional element of I've always been a marketer, I love brand design, consumer insights, and I just thought there was a very sort of juicy and important opportunity to use design to help combat 100 years of stigma and propaganda and how do we storytell and, and bring a different point of view than um, the somewhat limited one that, that was expressed, I think, under uh, prohibition. And then lastly was what I consider sort of a leadership opportunity uh, is what I called it at the time. And to me, that was just the idea of shaping an industry uh, and doing it thoughtfully and with values and um, with equity. And, and you know, everyone's mentioned that and we'll talk more about that, but especially given the history of this plant and mass incarceration, mostly of folks of color, there is an impair a moral imperative, I believe, in, in how we operate this industry. And, and that's for everyone at every level. Anyway, so the combination brought me into cannabis. I still am. Um, I love it. You guys all have such amazing journeys um, and perspectives on you know, why you joined this industry and your place in it. And I want to just uh, jump into you know, some of the questions that, that we're going to cover today. Um, and you know, panelists, feel free to jump in um, as you wish. So you know, we know there are a lot of disparities between women and men in the workforce and other industries. What are the specific challenges for women in our industry in cannabis? I'd love if some of you guys to talk about that. I mean, I can hop in on, on that. And I think for, you know, for me, one of the biggest ones become financial. 
um, funding becomes a huge place where we see financial disparities within, uh, you know, cannabis. Um, because as we see more money come into this space, um, we see less female CEOs. Um, the number of female leadership in, the, um, in this space has been dumping down as we see more money pour in. Um, and I think that it's, you know, directly relating to these numbers that we're seeing, you know, uh, everyone knows that in the space, you know, we can't go to a bank and get a bank loan. I can't go to B of A. Um, and we're in positions where VC money is king right now. VCs are giving 2% of their money to female led businesses. And if you're brown like me, um, you know, black women are getting 0.0006% of that money. And so if we're talking about a competitive landscape, what is the opportunity for us to be able to compete if we're not able to get funded to a position where we can compete fairly within that market. Funding becomes a really hard place um, for us to, to you know, find fairness with, within the market. And that's why you, know, you see a lot of advocates out there pushing for um, ways to, to see other types of funding coming in, pushing um, for, for equity funds and, and those sort of things, because without having access to capital, that becomes one of the largest barriers to entry um, you know, for females in the space. Anybody else want to weigh in? Well, I'm happy to add something there. And we, I agree with what Winnie said. I think that is um, the first and biggest sort of uh, hurdle for women getting into the industry. I also think there's a lot of practical issues. You know, we we speak kind of in sometimes in code in our industry about the misogyny that is running rampant. It is real. It is loud. It is unfortunately not going away fast enough. Uh, and I think that that inherently creates a sort of synapse and in, in opportunity, and also just practically speaking, safety. I, I you know I run a brand. I think about this all the time. I have, I can tell you, I have more than once been confronted with a situation where one of my female salespeople has been locked in a dispensary back room or threatened or whatever. As an employer, does that mean that I shouldn't hire women because they have a unique challenge to their own personal safety and therefore it becomes a liability? These are things we don't like to talk about but they are running a lot of the processes, systems, and bias that end up employing people in our industry. I am a person who has, you know, has confronted many of these situations and I continue to employ women. I continue to uh, have a dominant uh, culture in my, in my company of female everything, uh, but I suspect that that is a driver for a lot of other folks to not hire women. And that's not going to go away until, A, we talk about it, honestly, and we talk about it with men. You know, I, I was recently in Barcelona speaking at a conference there, and the topic of safety came up, and I was very honest about my own experience in the industry. I've been sexually harassed. I've been physically assaulted. Like, this is a hard industry to work in. That's real. And after the fact, and this happens every time I, I speak in front of men. A very well-intentioned young man from uh, the media came up to me and said, you know, I got to tell you, I think this is a uniquely, you know, American problem. I don't think that safety is an issue in Europe, in European cannabis. I said, I listened to him and I was like, have you talked to any women? Have you asked them? Because I have this conversation with my male CEO friends all the time. Ask your female employees what their experience is. I don't think that there is a, I, I really don't think it's a maniacal thing that there is just like this cohort of men who want to keep us down and keep us unsafe. I think they just don't know. And we need to talk about it and we need to take the stigma of just, you know, this very, very touchy, terrible topic. We need to confront it. We need to deal with it. But I do think that is something that is creating a, a sort of a gap and, you know, as much as we have folks who feel pressure to report diversity and, you know, hiring practices that reflect that, there are also then the practical issues of, okay, is this safe? Is there an inherent difference between hiring a woman and a man in this industry? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. And, and how do we bridge that gap? 
I really um, appreciate you speaking out about that. And I think, you know, talking about it is one, is, is like obviously the most important thing, but you know, the research does show that women-owned businesses actually perform better than others, but you know, yet women are received less support. So aside from talking about it, how can we combat some of these biases against women when we know women-run businesses thrive? What are some tips you can give to some of our people listening today? I'll jump in here. Um, I just recently heard um, Dr. Yaba Blay. If folks don't know who Dr. Yaba Blay is, I highly suggest looking up all of her work. She's a rock star. But one of the ways that she has framed sort of anti-racism and how to be an ally in that standpoint is let's move away from the word ally and move more towards the word accomplice. And I think about this similarly in how we support, you know, other women and women identifying folks in the space is that, you know, ally is great, but ally in theory means I support you. Now, sure, does accomplice have sort of some sort of like crime related terminology when you look up the definition, but let's all ignore that for now. What I mean is accomplice is more so where do I need to be and what do I need to do to support you? Not just go get them girls, you know, like I'm so tired of that. Like, you know, oh, we're going to throw a bunch of pictures of women who work for us on our website. Look at us. That's not the work, you know, and we want accomplices in the work that are going to show up and actually advocate. And I think it goes in particularly to you know, cis males as well, being accomplices with us, you know, not just allies. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of tired of the lip service and the pictures and the things like that. That's not, you know, that's not going to make the real change. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's in my, in my ways, like, how do we combat that? We need more accomplices. We need them screaming in the streets, right? And we need them really doing the actual work. And then on top of that, I'm a nerd. I love spreadsheets, data, 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 right? Um, let's, you know, unlike men who are often given opportunities based on their potential for success, right? We are often given opportunities based on our experience and success. As much as I hate that, it's still a reality and that's what we, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But the bottom line is show up with receipts and a lot of them, right? Have that data because you have a response for every question to anyone that is going to say, you know, no, we're all set. Well, here's the proof. Yeah, my friend, uh, a friend of ours, Emily Pax, always says something needs to be the hardest worker in the room when you're a woman, right? And showing up with that data is part of it. We just have to be armed with more ammunition than our male counterparts sometimes. So I think that's a really, really great tip. Which it's not okay, but we still got to fight hard. We still got to do it, you know? I can pipe in. I think absolutely the first thing that came to mind is results, which is like just do good work and make sure people know about it, which sometimes uh, women don't do as well. And, and honestly, to me, what came up when you asked, how do we combat it? It's sort of the opposite of the first question of what are the challenges? What are the strengths of being a woman? So there are many, um, but I think it's about leaning into that. And so for me, that could mean anything from your function and what you're excellent at to, of course, uh, female cannabis consumers and reaching this gigantic and growing core cohort in a way that obviously men could not do sort of in general to the same degree. Um, and sometimes management, you know, I don't want to stereotype, but, but there, there have been times or there is some data of um, women approaching management differently, whether it's more um, people first or holistic or whatnot. There are absolutely benefits, again, on average, um, to being a woman in this space and carving out a unique voice that is not at the forefront. And, and so we, I think we need to uh, celebrate that too. I think for, you know, for us over at JB, one of the ways that we, we promote that is, you know, for us, it's about inclusive supply chain. Um, you know, from the, you know, from the very beginning, we, were mindful to make sure that we got bids from, uh, you know, companies from our construction and our architects, you know, to interior design, you know, to the, the brands that we have on our shelves, making sure that we were representing women led, you know, uh, brands. And um, it's funny because uh, all of our team, um, especially in the beginning, um, we were all females and people were like, oh, you guys picked an all-female all team. No, we picked the best people for the job and they just happened to be females. Um, and, and, that, and we were mindful to make sure that we looked at a larger, broader group and then we brought in um, as we were doing that hiring. Um, but I think that 
it really helped set a vibe and an aesthetic for Josephine and Billy's that was that, you know, paid off for us at the end. Um, and, you know, I think that it's important now that with the store being open, that we prioritize having those women led black, brown, uh, LGBTQ led brands on our shelves. And that's something that we can do to make sure that we're prioritizing, um, making sure that we have an outlet for those women led businesses. Um, at least brand wise, um, when it's time for them to come to the shelves, you know, um, and, and throughout the supply chain, making sure that we are being mindful as women business owners to keep an eye out for those other business owners when we can work in concert together. That's another way that we can all, you know, rising tides lift all boats. I love that, Whitney. And actually, to Maggie's point, we don't, women, we don't always, uh, scream from the rooftops from doing amazing things. I'd love to hear from each of you what you guys are doing to make cannabis or your companies more inclusive. I, I'd love to tell you guys to shout that out. I know Maggie, I remember we first started talking, you guys, you know, with the CEDO, some of your ad campaigns really like aim to be uh, diverse and inclusive. So each of you, please talk about some of those things that you guys are implementing in your companies or for the industry. Abby, wanna go first? Oh, I've got lots of people on the spot, but I, I know that you're doing a lot of great work. So I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> well, I love what, uh excuse me, what Whitney said, because uh, my uh, executive team is all women. And I get that stupid question all the time, right? Where it's like, you know, oh, you just picked all women, eh? No, these are incredible women who went through introvert views who are the right, most exceptional person for the role. Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, and I mean, there's, there's so much, I'm not really sure where to even begin, but obviously on some of the more surface level things, you know, we, we, I always approach anything we do having sort of equity and inclusion at the forefront, right? One of my biggest pet peeves is when particularly cis white males say that's an HR thing. No, it's not. That is in every single action of our company, regardless of what it is. And to Whitney's point, it's vendors. It's anybody at all, right? Um, so that's first and foremost. And then similarly, um, you know, we're doing quarterly trainings, multiple different types of trainings, really digging in to, um, you know, talking about it. Let's talk about it. Um, we, as a logistics company, you know, are very much um, logistics and security focused, right? That is already in and of itself a, w a white male dominated space. And so we kind of have to go the extra mile around recruitment um, and our efforts around recruitment to ensure that, you know, the right people are getting opportunities with us. Um, we have partnered with a number of organizations uh, nationally and here in Massachusetts so that not only are we, um, you know, doing the work internally, but also making sure that, you know, we are supporting those efforts with our people, our resources, and our money, right? That, that is important. Um, and I'd say one of the biggest things that I wanted to kind of promote here um, is I provide free consulting um, and mentorships uh, to women in the space, particularly folks who are uh, pursuing um, you know, home delivery type applications here in Massachusetts, that is a license type that is social equity and economic empowerment only folks. And so um, I am constantly saying, hey, hey, come to me, I will give you every resource under the sun to help you get going. Um, and that doesn't need to cost a dime, um, especially if they're women run, I, you know, I'm far more partial to give some uh, mentoring and, and, um, and free consulting there. But I think uh, mentor mentorships, are huge when I talk about accomplices, right? Um, I want some of my own and I also wanna be one for others. Um, so I think that's kind of a high level overview of some of the things we do. I could get in the weeds, but I wanna hear so much more from everybody else. I'll jump in um, and Abby, that's impressive and so nice to hear across the country what's going on. Um, at Loon, we're mission dri driven from the jump. So that's, it's built into the ethos of the brand and whether that is the work that we do for social justice reform or, you know, something you touched on Rosie with uh, about the CEDO and what Maggie's built. Similarly, we're really thoughtful, we're brand, right? So we're, we're, I really take that seriously. We're putting out content constantly, imagery, how models are chosen, what they look like, what they represent that matters, right? These are choices we are, we're at the forefront of making these decisions and showing, creating this like 3.0 version of the consumer and showing the masses what that new consumer looks like and making those choices thoughtfully and consciously. Um, but something that you said, Abby, that stuck, sticks in my mind and I think it's the little things that really, that really, really move the dial the furthest, which is picking up the phone for other women or other minorities. Um, being a resource, showing up, sharing resources, sharing contacts. 
I think a huge barrier in our industry to success is it's just like a weird locked box of information, whether it's somebody starting a new brand and they don't understand, fully understand compliance or the regulatory environment of just how to do R&D on something, or you know, maybe it's something uh, much more complex. There seems to be like this, it's, it's not like you can go to school and get a degree in how to build a successful cannabis business. And honestly, there's not very many good examples of it, right? So we're all figuring it out from the jump. And I think taking the calls, being, being open to sharing, you know, because there does seem to be a dominant thing in vibe in our industry, which is like to just to just be really closed off and that it's hyper competitive and that we all need to keep our little playbooks to ourselves. Um, I've really chosen and over time opened, opened up to this realization that it's all white space. There's still so much more room and I'd rather be surrounded by people I want to see succeed. And that means helping them. And that means showing up and, and being a, a resource. So I think that's a really, I mean, it, it sounds like a small thing, but I think it's a really, you know, when I think about the leapfrogs that I've been able to make in this industry, it's because people took my call or answered my text. I love that. Maggie, want to cap off? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the intersectionality conversation is critical, especially again given the history of this industry. So one of one of my biggest points here is that we don't wait for regulators to deem equity, because as we know, we'd wait, we're, we've been waiting. So instead, what are we all doing every day within our control? When I was running Besito, absolutely using um, our marketing budget to give the mic over to tell the story and history of prohibition and folks affected most by the war on drugs and, and activists. I was built into the biz business model, 1% of all sales. I've come together with, with some of the folks here to, to gather resources and have more impact. I totally agree with what Whitney said in that Sometimes people think it's like the CEO's job. And I really think at all levels, the choices you make every day can be intersectional. It takes a little more effort. If you're going to get a t-shirt instead of just the first t-shirt company you heard of, how do you look a little further for black owned swag or, or whatnot? And so every little business decision can have, you know, money is power. And, and so that's that. And then the most important thing um, is supporting the folks that are doing the work day in, day out and know it best. And so I want to give another shout out to Supernova Women and Whitney and one of my favorite and one of the oldest groups um, leading this work. And, and ultimately, you know, as brands and, and other businesses, we have our day-to-day -day business. I think the best thing we can do is ask those folks how they need support and show up and do it. I, I love all these answers. That's amazing, the work you guys are doing. And you know, Nidhi, you sort of touched on this in some way, but you know, behind most successful people is a network of people. Um, and, and I know this, you know, I would not be where I am if not for the network of women that, that I have and, and my mentors and my colleagues. Tell us about how you guys have each um, cultivated a support network for your career. Um, and how do you, and what's a good way for people to find that support system? Um, I can start here um, uh, because I'm a theater major. Got a master's degree in film production. None of that says con consumer goods. None of that says come operate a dispensary. So I needed some remedial cannabis 101. Um, and I, I really did need to, to hop in. I mean, I obviously, I, you know, I was a SVP over at Warner Brothers Telepictures doing um, business um, reality television development. Um, before I transferred into this space. Uh, one of the best things that I did for myself is I went through the Canopy um, Business um, Accelerator with Apothecary, 16 weeks. Um, it was kind of like, uh, you know, I tell people that was my MBA in, in cannabis in 16 weeks. I did not sleep. Um, I worked, you know, 16 hour days, but it taught me how to raise money. Um, and it gave me a network that I could fall back on um, and get answers in, you know, a day instead of where I was previously, where it would take me three weeks to understand this compliance issue. Or, you know, I'm running my face against the wall um, to get those answers. Um, some of the other networks that I was able to tap into 
um, early on. Um, I did Women's Grow um, when I was in the very uh, early stages. Um, it allowed me to meet other people who are in the space um, and just be able to have people who I could reach out to who are doing things that are similar that I could pick up the phone to call. It's it's. Th- you can't um, downplay enough how important it is to have people who can answer your phone call and cut down on the time in which you're going to be running around trying to find an answer um, in this space because uh, regulations change on an everyday basis. Uh, and you can be running your, you know, yourself ragged trying to find an answer that someone has and can give to you very simply as you're trying to figure out payment processing um, and the answers are out there. Um, I did um, the Ease Momentum Accelerator um, was something that I did that gave me um, additional uh, insights and uh, mentorship within the space that I found uh, very useful. Um, you know, networking within um, Supernova Women, we have um, uh, quarterly networking events um, that we throw um, on both coasts uh, that allowed us to connect with people who, again, uh, were in, um, you know, the same space uh, and being able to, you know, shake hands with those people and then change, exchange business cards and have those people be willing to take my call um, was extremely powerful for me. Um, Again, you know, this is not a space where you can read a book and get the answers. This is not a space also where people are always willing to give away information because they feel like it's trade secrets. You know, people think that they're, that they're got one up on you because you don't know. Um, so being able to find those friendlies, um, you know, are critical. I did a, a business mastermind um, within the Canada space that I also found to be very critical because I find, um, and even now within the space, it's very important that you have some people in your life, especially as a CEO, that you can talk to plainly. I can't make bills next month. What am I supposed to do? How do I get out? You know, I'm trying to scale and grow, but I need to be able to do X, Y, and Z. How do I make this happen? You know, you have to have some people around you that you can lay these things out for. And it's not going to be in your employees because you know what they don't want to hear? That you can't make bills? That's not a conversation for your employees. You need to build a circle around yourself. Um, and so uh, look into those, you know, those masterminds, because the first rule of a mastermind is that you cannot talk outside of a mastermind. Um, you know, loose li- lips sink ships. So building those communities around yourself um, become really important there. Um, so and for me, um, putting those networks in place was the difference maker. I would not be here right now if I had not built those networks. They have saved me time and time again. Those are amazing tips. Anybody else? Those are really great. I was just going to say, you know, that it's, it's this industry and we've, if people don't know it yet, we've probably made it clear. This industry is hard. Um, Every day there is a new struggle. Um, And so kind of just bouncing off of what Whitney said, like it is, it is okay to have humility. It is okay to be vulnerable and, and, you know, reach out to folks and say, I'm struggling or today this, you know, compliance issue was really hard, or I can't make payroll or whatever, right? Because that 15 minute conversation could give you the energy to get up and out of bed tomorrow. Um, So make the calls, be vulnerable, have that humility, um, because we're all struggling, you know, it's all hard. Um, And and, and granted, perhaps as women, are we more likely to um, show that vulnerability? Because, you know, that's just how we are, maybe. Um, but we can also model that for cis males in the world as well, that that's okay, and start to see that change. So I think, you know, yes, network, network, make those connections, have those mentors, be shameless in saying, I respect the heck out of you. Could you be my mentor? You know, folks will respond to that. Um, but I just think it's, it's, it's okay to say I'm struggling. I feel like it is often like a, a male dominated way to be like, I'm good. Everything's good. You know, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and, and just own it. Cause, cause owning that um, is probably going to bring you the more valuable and constructive conversations than, than, you know, saying we're, we're awesome and never we're killing it every day. So, yeah. I'll add two notes. Um, same thing, be reaching out and showing up. So I reached out cold 2015 to a few women who over the years have become um, investors, advisors, mentors. And one note on mentorship, sort of tactical, 
sometimes there's this idea that like the mentor will decide. And I'm a big believer that like the mentee has to be driving that relationship. Um, and, and so that's something just, you know, mindfully, and of course it has to go both ways, but something I did was like regularly checking up with these folks, whether I wanted their advice or whatnot. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing I think is unique about our industry, and this was in 2015, but I think it holds true today is like, when I was at Starbucks, you didn't meet someone else from coffee and go out to lunch, but like, there's still that vibe with cannabis as a new industry that like, it's new and we want to talk about it. And I do think there's a um, interest in bringing more women, more folks of color, et cetera, into the industry. And so, you know, raising your hand, sharing what you're good at, that's it, where there's tons of jobs and they're growing. And so anyways, just encourage everybody, especially women, women of color to, to get into the industry. We need you. Maybe anything to add? Yeah, I would just say, you know, and I echo everything that all of these ladies have said, but um, there's something very like dynamic happening in our industry right now, which is that it's becoming corporatized and we're starting to see a lot of the same patterns emerge that you'd see in any other industry, like the great shuffle. You're seeing people who were worked at one company appear in another, whether it's a dispensary or it's an MSO or it's a cultivator or whatever. Um, I just think this basic idea of people first, like make your relationships, be honorable and be kind and conscious and build relationships with people. Um, I, I've had it's just so many like opportunities to see that come into fruition. Uh, people remember you as a person and how you behave and the integrity that you walk in. Uh, it's, you know, there, we all get like, you know, brief moments in our respective companies where, where our star is high. And most of the time, it's just a lot of hard work and, and putting your head down and working your tail off. But I find that when you've been honorable, when you've been somebody who's asked beyond, to Maggie's point, we still have this really cool thing happening in our industry where we, where we still like to see each other face to face. You know, cannabis was deemed essential, as we all know, and we didn't stop working for the last two years. Um, and people were still in the fields uh, growing the weed and in the dispensary selling it. And... What that means is, is that ask each other how we're doing, uh, be human to one another. I think it's, it's, it's something really special about our industry that, that we get to participate in. Um, and people are, I mean, I, I've had so many, so many examples of people who I unwittingly did a good deed for who've now shown up in a place where they're really helpful to me. And I think it's, it's a basic, I grew up in a business family and that was kind of like, you know, family business 101, you know, that the basics of just treat other people well. Uh, but I think it particularly resounds in this industry, especially as we see folks shuffling around. It's, 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 it's pretty, it's pretty basic, but I think it's a good tip. I love all that. Um, and, you know, we're getting close to time. We still have a little bit of time. So I want to get into change gears a little bit, um, a little bit in, into brands, you know, the female consumer. Um, a recent report by Head said, uh, said Gen Z women are now the fastest growing consumers of legal cannabis. Um, I think increasing year over year sales by 151%. How do you think that will change the industry? Like, how does female consumers like change that? I, I just want to say that I think that this kind of data is like really misleading. I, I, and I, I'm, I'm huge as a woman who has a brand in this industry. I took a big bet when I built my company that that data was wrong. I think that women are not new to this, like to our industry, we're new to transacting with weed. We have been socialized for decades to send our men to deal with a drug dealer. So the act of actually transacting with cannabis is maybe new. Consumption is not. And I think understanding that and, and really seeing it and understanding that, hey, women, you know, we know that we, we're making 80% of the spending decisions for the average American or North American household. Uh, weed is not different. The difference is the stigma curve. And the stigma curve is, it's, it's crazy going down right now. It's like, it's, it's incredible what's happening. And we've all seen that over the last few years. COVID has actually, you know, just, I think, increased the speed at which the stigma has gone down. So 
I think it's, you know, it's interesting because, you know, as someone with a brand that is servicing a pretty damn close to 50-50 male-female consumer, I am really like constantly intrigued by this notion that women are new consumers. I think we're we might be new transactors, but uh, that's important because I think that now that we're speaking to women more, we're starting to see consumer trends, right? Consumer trends typically dominate what people buy in every other industry. Cannabis has been a little upside down in that respect because we've been such a verticalized industry, meaning that the folks making the decisions are the ones growing the weed. That's a very different dynamic. So as we start understanding and getting real about the fact that hey, women have been part of this party the whole time, maybe now we see them show up in the data, um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's good for us because it's giving us the opportunity to, to start being more thoughtful about the way that we market, the way that we create products. But ultimately, um, I think if we, you can just look into your anecdotal life, I think you'll find that uh, w women have been consuming forever. And, and, you know, it's an important nuance. And, you know, perhaps for some folks, this seems to be new information. But I think that it's, it's, it's common sense to a large degree. I don't know. I'd be curious what you think, Whitney, having a dispensary. Uh, and what you see on the ground. You're, you're 100 percent right on on the consumption level. I mean, we're not new to this. We're true to this. Um, but, you know, I think the data, um, you know, to your point, um, you know, is just uh, backing up, um, you know, the, the delay, the stigma curve going down. You know, these people are now comfortable coming into the dispensary. But, you know, yes, they've been sending their guys out to buy cannabis. Um, I'm hoping that the these numbers, um, you know, I'm hoping that these numbers uh, will convince funders to back a little bit more female-led businesses, um, you know, because for a long time, the only thing that we saw that was, you know, that was pushed towards female was we're just going to dip this package in pink. Um, or we're just, you know, that's not, that's not me or what have you, or, you know, even when we went out to pitch this place, um, you know, it, it was a very hard sell. They told me, you know, women don't smoke enough weed and brown women, you know, God, that's such a small demographic, you know, you're talking to a, a infinitesimal uh, group of people. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> like, there are so many women of color out there who consume. And I'm hope for me, I'm hoping that this data um, allows uh, the people who we had to spend so much time convincing that the, this demographic exists, um, you know, the, the proof necessary to, to get all these women who've been working so hard in this space, the funding necessary to get their businesses off the ground. Yeah, and I actually want to, you talked about that a little earlier, Whitney, and I, I think, um, you know, we've all faced this challenge as women, but, you know, some of you guys have raised capital. What advice can you give women when they're going out to raise capital? You know, that's the biggest challenge. What are some tips? Nidhi, you want to go? Sure. Um, I, I think we touched on this earlier, but be prepared and be ready to talk with real information. Uh, I, I really think that ultimately, and I've been in many, many rooms with men who have started the conversation by, you know, calling me sweetheart or honey or little girl even. Um, and very quickly, the tone shifts when I start talking and presenting information in a thoughtful, well laid out way. So I think that, you know, ultimately, and maybe it is a little idealistic or optimistic to say that that's enough, but I, I do think just be, be damn prepared. I mean, you know, we might be women in cannabis, but we didn't wake up as women uh, the day that we entered this industry. But this has been going on for our entire lives, right? So like the unique challenge to like the, you know, the road to success of, of being part of any kind of minority group, right, is that you have to learn how to how to put your best foot forward and for, you know, whatever your unique challenge to not become an impediment to, to success. Raising money, I think, is no different to that. And I, I do think that there is, uh, you know, very clear, clear data and just even anecdotally, I think it is harder for women to get, to get the meetings. But I also think the flip side of that is that we're in an industry that has like a light on it right now and folks want to do the right thing, even if not for the right reasons. Take 
the introductions and the meetings, like get off the damn high horse of like, I don't want a favor, I don't want this. Because you have to be the one who shows up in the room. You have to be the one to put yourself behind the thing, right? If you're not drinking your own Kool-Aid, nobody else is going to be. If you don't have the passion and the conviction and the data and the whole thing, it doesn't really matter. But however the hell you get into the room, get in the room and then be prepared. Like, it, I think it really is, uh, you know, not quite that simple, but I think that's a big part of it. Love it. Data, 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 data. That, that's for me how we were able to overcome all those obstacles. Um, you can argue the point. You can tell me that you don't like our space, but I can always come back and say, you know, um, this is how many women of color, you know, 73% of women in Los Angeles um, are women of color. So you can't tell me that this demographic doesn't exist if I know that that's the number, um, you know, and I can tell you that, you know, that demographic spent a billion dollars last year in this similar vertical. And as we start breaking those numbers down, it becomes very difficult to argue. So definitely step into that um, room with, with data. Um, and also to, to back up that point, um, you got to come into the room knowing that you got it you know, uh, having that attitude that you've got it. Because if you walk in that room thinking that, that oh, this is gonna be another no and, and coming at it from an attitude that you're not gonna make it happen, you're not gonna make it happen. Um, I collect no's, you know, all the time. People say no to me constantly. If I got a sad attitude or said, I'm not gonna, you know, pitch again because I got a no, I would never get anywhere. Um, I take it as I collect no's to get a yes. In order to get to my yes, I'm gonna have to get through a ton of no's. I might have to get through 50 no's. I might have to get to 100 no's, but each one of those no's are going to refine me till I get to my yes. And what's important about those no's is being able to ask the questions, why isn't this an investment for you? What do, would I need to change in order to make this investment right for you? What, you know, what are you looking for? I'm um, being able to take those answers and be able to continue to refine your deck, refine the conversation, refine your answers, refine the way that you're looking at this data to make it an appealing investment. That's what you're looking for. Um, and being able to find that, um, uh, that lead investor that is going to be a help. Because also you've got to remember that in this space and in all spaces, all money is not good money. Um, you don't want to take every dollar put in front of you. You need to find partners that are going to be worthwhile um, and, and useful for you on your cap table. Um, and that's also critical for your growth. Love it. Yes, 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 Whitney. Gosh, I love it. Um, I love those, by the way. <laughs> Asking back, what, like, why is this not for you? What a great question. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I mean, one thing I said to this whole group of women before we start, right, is uh, you breathe in, I am, breathe out, worthy. You are worthy. You know, if you show up and you know, and you're passionate and you know you have the right idea and you get all those no's, it, exactly what Whitney said, maybe you don't want that per that group or that person to invest in you, right? You're going to have a really long relationship with them if they do. You know, if you want to have commitments to your, your own DEI work, like, and you're going to get pushed back every step of the way from the folks giving you, you know, the funding like you don't want that right um and so yes it is awful to get the 50 no's but the person who says yes is going to be the right partner um and and, and so you are worthy of the right partner and and sure when you do get a yes you probably want to jump on it you know and they might not be the perfect partner but um but still they're the right one they see the vision and that means that they see that you are worthy love it um I'll just yes, add on top quickly, like, keep going. That was the biggest thing for me is you just got to keep going because, yeah, a million no's in different ways. Um, and once you do sort through some of the, the clowns and you do find a champion or two, typically they invest with other folks. And so, again, tactically, but um, sometimes all it takes, in my experience, is one or two champions who then pull in their network to also invest because uh, they believe in you and they're not coming with you know a different agenda or whatnot so uh get your get your money money <laughs> and i think this is a similar question um but it's a different flavor on it because people people have asked this what is the best way for women to actually enter their cannabis industry to get their first job or advance their careers, right? Like what are those first logical steps people can take? I'll give a little plug to another female founder, Banks, um, in the cannabis industry staffing, staffing uh, platform. Definitely check that out. But what are some of your advice for people who want to get in the space? 
Yeah. I was just going to say, remember, you already have the skills. Um, just because it's cannabis doesn't mean that there are so many other skills that you have that will apply here. Um, so know that you have those skills. Um, I mean, that's just for getting into cannabis, right? Um, you know, no regulations, learn compliance, even if you're doing, you know, what you think might not have anything to do with it, that is going to set you apart in an interview. Um, so I always say, read the regs, read them, read them, read them. Uh, it's not fun and it's not sexy reading, but it's still, you got to do it. Um, but, but I would say just, you know, speak to your skills, speak to your strengths. There is a place for you. Um, if you are advancing, um, you know, that's a whole nother conversation where I think goes back to our mentorship conversation. It goes back to a lot of things and I would be happy uh, to speak to anybody on this panel about that um, after the fact, because I know we're getting close to time. Um, but I would, I would just, you know, keep reminding yourself that just because it's the cannabis industry doesn't mean that you don't have skills already and there isn't a place for you here. Anyone else? Well, that's the next one. Um, okay, so I know nothing takes the place of, you know, getting in the field and getting your, your, your hands dirty. But I know for me, um, you know, sometimes books and podcasts and resources are a great way for us to get comfortable with actually some of the language, um, you know, sharpening up our, our business skills or, you know, investing in ourselves. Are there any like key resources that you guys, you know, turn to when, when you need inspiration or, or you need to learn? I think, you know, getting people getting their hands on things could be super helpful. Um, I'll say that for me, it was really going to industry events. I, and they're coming back now. And I, I think, by far, I've learned so much more from actually interacting with the community of cannabis professionals and going and listening to people speak and, and things like this. I mean, kudos to everybody who's attending in the middle of the day or at the end of the day if you're on the East Coast. Um, I, there's just so many nuggets you can get. We are a new industry. It is really like, don't, don't be intimidated. Everybody is figuring out as they go. Most people have no idea what they're doing when they get started. You know, it's just boatloads of common sense combined with, you know, a conviction to want to do it. Um, so I, for me, I mean, that's been just endlessly whenever I feel uninspired or stuck, you know, I make an effort to find some event to go to, to listen to people talk. And I, it's just what you learn from other people's experiences is, is so invaluable. And I want to make a point to that. Abby mentioned, you know, when we were in the pre-panel, we were just chatting about this imposter syndrome and Nitty made the same point too. None of us know what we are doing. So you shouldn't feel like you are alone. Like we're all figuring this out as it's a new industry. Um, you know, we're, we're building something. So you should never feel that like you don't know something. None of us do. Um, so that's like my that, don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything. I, 70 people work for me. I don't know anything, but I'm learning every day. So we're all in this together. You guys should all think about that, you know, but when you have those moments of self-doubt. Um, for me, I have, um, I definitely, when I came into the space, had no idea how fundraising worked at all. Like someone asked me for an executive profile and I sent them like uh, a bio with a picture of myself on it. Thinking back, it's like the most embarrassing thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, but uh, the book Venture Deals really gave me a really great overview of that whole process. Gave me a, a really good overview of the terms and really, uh, you know, made me feel really comfortable um, understanding what was going to happen as I went out to do my first raise with Apothecary seven years ago. So when people are telling me, you know, oh, I'm gonna go out and raise for the first time, that's what I would suggest. You know, if you're, you're looking to do something, you think that you're gonna end up raising capital, grab that book, read it, it's a really good read. Amazing. Um, one thing right now that's just helping me with my overall mental health doesn't have anything to do with cannabis or business, but it's the podcast. We can do hard things with Glenn and Doyle. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, you know, when I just need to pick me up, um, uh, while I'm driving from one facility to the other, that's been really helping me. So that's one thing. Other thing, if you are tired and you are exhausted and you are frustrated and you're like, why am I doing this? Please, please, please look at things like the last prisoners project go and read, you know, the new Jim Crow again, like re ground yourself in like the, the why and, and the goal and the change that we, like, why we're here, why being anti-prohibitionist is so important, why this work is so important. Um, and then th that I, I hope gives you, you know, energy for another day. Maggie, cap us off. I like reading the investment reports. 
not so fun. <laughs> But um, really big picture, I always like to, you know, know my market inside and out. Now I'm working in several markets, um, but also have a sense of what's going on nationally. So that's sort of my favorite content as well as like industry stuff, MJ Biz Daily. I think tactically as far as recruiting, this is still a state by state industry. And so it's just most important that you know who's operating around you. Um, obviously your skill set and what you want to do, but then who is licensed to do that around you? And that would, and knowing that list of companies uh, and, and checking out their job boards, as well as the recruiters, banks, flower hire, uh, there's several. So Canada's jobs are growing, growing like fire. And again, everyone, we need, we need you all. So get on board. Come join us. Come on. Well, you know, we're at the end of, of our session. We, uh, we, we did really well on time, guys. I'm very proud of us. Um, but this was a super um, inspiring conversation. Thank you to all of our panelists uh, for joining us today. Thank you for all of our participants who are listening. Um, and happy International Women's Month, everybody. Bye. Thank you for having us.